those, those goats will eat just about anything. Okay, we better move on to the lesson. Starting uh, lesson 101 on white magic. Getting near the end. We were mm -hmm. talking about the problems the masters have with uh, disciples and getting getting things done through disciples work. Us uh, people are we're all willing to do uh, to be servants and to help the hierarchy, but uh, we're all a bunch of klutzes in a lot of ways. And the fact that uh, when the masters try to work with us, they're probably like wringing their hands quite a bit, thinking, "Oh man." <laughs> I'd probably be better off if I just went and did this myself. <laughs> Have you ever done that yourself? You try to get somebody else to do something and then you think, you know, I might as well just do it myself. <laughs> It'd be easier. And when you try to get somebody else to do something that you want done, that's what uh, you often find is that uh, uh, they don't do it the way you want it done and it's a little frustrating, but you know, if you're going to create any type of organization, it's you've uh, got to have it. So different people will do different things efficiently, but nobody is perfect. And so in, say, running a business, so when you have employees, some will do their jobs pretty good and you can depend on them. Others just about drive you crazy. And so... Uh, um, it's it's very difficult to get things done where you depend on other people and unfortunately for the masters they have to depend on us regular mortals to get anything done and so that's what we were kind of discussing was kind of the problems the masters have and 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 working with us even very intelligent disciples create problems one of the ones that uh, dk talks about was uh Madame Blavatsky in her previous life, she was uh, uh, Count Cagliostro and he, she, he said he, they were expecting uh, the Count to just uh, do a great innovative work and he went entirely the wrong direction. And he said he set back the work of the hierarchy quite a bit because uh, even though he was a very intelligent person. He didn't follow the will of the hierarchy. He followed pretty much his own will and what he wanted to do. And then he said uh, he uh, incarnated as Madame Blavatsky, a female this time, and said he did, a, uh, Madame Blavatsky did a lot in making up for lost time, that she performed her work quite well, and so she recovered some of the time and energy that was lost. And so this is what we do as disciples. We, uh, everything doesn't always go smooth. Uh, we, we make mistakes, but the important thing is when we make mistakes is to backtrack and then proceed in the right direction. And uh, if the disciple has in his mind the thought of uh, pure intent, then even though he makes mistakes, uh, they will correct them and proceed and improve. And um, so the hierarchy also talks about this in admitting new people to an ashram. In an ashram, it's a little bit like a molecule and the fact that uh, they, uh, they, the, a life admitted into a master's group is uh, part becomes part of that one life. And so it, the new person entering becomes like a weak link that has to totally adjust. So he has to adjust to the group and the group has to adjust to him. And DK says it takes a while for the group to adjust to the new energy. And it's a, it's a sacrifice for the group to let a new entity in because uh, uh, the energy has to, uh, has to adjust and uh, the person coming in isn't used to handling the high energies in the, uh, in the master's group.
Another thing is that we, uh, as the fourth kingdom of nature, are the pivot point. We're the balance point. And hierarchy depends on us to make progress. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the hierarchy has to work through humanity, and we're certainly a flawed bunch, so they've got their job cut out for them. And this is what he points out. He says, uh, uh, there's a, a general unprepared and flawed condition of humanity, and this adds to the difficulty of the work of disciples. In other words, even if a disciple sees clearly what he has to do for his mission, uh, the, uh, the flawed condition of humanity produces a resistance that makes it difficult for him to get anything done. And I notice the greater the light, the greater the difficulty of permeating humanity. And the people that really uh, have had success with like New Age material have really uh, kind of uh, not that great a material. It's just the fact that they speak to the average guy and it may not be that great. Like um, say, let's take uh, the book, The Celestine Prophecy. Uh, it was critics always criticize it for being, it was, they say it's a very, very poorly written for a fictional uh, book. You know, <laughs> and you know it isn't that great. Uh, it wasn't the, the writing wasn't that great, but he he presented some uh, insights that kind of the average uh, seeker could kind of glom onto, and so it became a really big seller, which was amazing. But it didn't really have any like new material, and it's just he presented it in a way that uh, the public the average seeker could kind of identify with somewhat. So, uh, uh, but then you take somebody like the works of Alice A. Bailey, her books still do not sell very much. They've only, I think each book, maybe each year, uh, the average sale of the books, just a couple hundred or something like that. It's not very many. Um, yet, they contain, I think, the greatest light available on the planet right now. Yet, uh, uh, people are not lining up to read the books. But those who have read them and study them have decimated the, or uh, not decimated, but uh, uh, put out the material and to people so that uh, they've had a, a lot stronger impact than the sales of the books uh, would make you think. Oh, he says, some disciples also show physical stress and they'll break down emotionally and they'll either develop detachment or become neurotic. So uh, when a disciple has, uh, picks a work to do and he gets a little inspiration, uh, he has he undergoes quite a bit of emotional stress in getting anything done, and so uh, he he has to go one way or the other. He has to learn to be detached, so he doesn't identify too much with all the problems in uh, in advancing the work. Uh, so he has to obtain the viewpoint of the observer. And if he doesn't do this, he's likely to become neurotic, as the uh, uh, Tibetan says here. He says, still others have problems on mental levels. They become bewildered. In some case, cases, no new clear truth appears. Then they work without inspiration, and because they know it to be right, they also have a rhythm of the work. In other words, those disi uh, disciples that uh, they they sense the truth, the truth is out there. A little bit like uh, the X Files guy, uh, they they sense that the truth is out there, uh, and they glom on to what truth they can find, but they don't really have make that connecting link to the soul. So they read all kinds of materials. 
and they put together the best they know how and they proceed that way and they have this this in instinct to work toward helping humanity but they don't know quite what to do so they just follow the highest they know if they follow the highest they know long enough then they will have the inspiration come but in between that they uh, there's a lot of disciples out there that are just kind of working in the dark and not sure if they're headed the right direction or not, but they just keep on plowing ahead no matter what. And uh, like I say, if, if they follow the highest they know, sooner or later, more light always does come. So people, disciples need to always gather that faith in themselves that the light will come if their intent is good. Now, if their intent becomes selfish, where they want praise and power and authority over others, then the light will not come. But if they work with pure intent, then sooner or later the clouds will break and greater light will come. He says, still others build up separative organizations, pattern after their own desires, rather than in harmony with the divine plan. And these are the ones that, uh, that put blockage between them and their souls so they can work away and a greater light doesn't come, but they might uh, wind up uh, with a pretty good organization and a lot of students and uh, maybe pretty happy with their own selves and uh, on a personality level. Now disciples, he says, may be so full of what is called the personality that their service gradually and steadily st step down to the level of that personality and is consequently colored by their personality reactions, their likes and dislikes, and their individual life tendencies and habits. These eventually assert themselves and there is then a worker doing good work, but spoiling it all by this unrealized separativeness and individual methods. This means that a much such a worker gathers to himself only those whom he can subordinate and govern. This is always a problem. This is a problem that happens a lot of uh, organizations. The leader gathers to himself people that he can subordinate and govern. And you can tell when this happens that if you're in a group such as this and you ask a question that goes against anything that the leader has taught, he will become upset. And when you see this in any leader that he's upset because you ask an innocent question that may uh, go against his thought form, if he gets upset, and uh, then the, it, this is this is the type of problem here, is that uh, he's he's seeking power for himself rather than service. The inspired leader uh, will not get upset over any sincere question. He says this group is not colored by the impulses of the new age, but by the separative instincts of the worker at the center. The danger here is so subtle that much care must be taken by a disciple in self-analysis. It's so easy to be glamored by the beauty of one's own ideals and vision, by the supposed resuscitude of one's position, and yet all the time be influenced subjectively by the love of personal power, of individual ambition, jealousy of other workers, and the many traps which kits the feet of the unwary disciple. So he points out that, you know, just because a person's a disciple, because he's advanced, doesn't mean everything is, is easy. We have all kinds of problems that we have to undergo. And many times a disciple will spend a lifetime or two caught in these traps, even as a teacher, before he can work his way out of it and become uh, a really good vessel to be used by the hierarchy. He also points out something interesting. 
that uh, he says something that we're unaware of is is we uh, we're flawed on our level, but every life, no matter how high up it goes, has their own problems to solve. The masters have their problems to solve. The logos of the entire planet has his uh, problems to solve. The solar logos has his problems to solve. We all have their pro- we all have our problems to solve. And he says, who knows um, the masters that uh, maybe are working with a group of individuals, they may be complaining about them, <laughs> but maybe the masters are screwing up in what they're supposed to be perfecting themselves. Maybe the disciples are doing better on his level than the master on his level. And you can look on this like on a lower level. Maybe your dog that you're training is doing a lot better job at his training than you're doing at yours, but you're just at different levels. So uh, we're all at different levels, but all of us have struggles. And as DK points out, even the masters have their problems that they're dealing with, and they may not be dealing with them as well as they should. But because we're on a lower level, we can't see or even judge how they're doing. Just like your dog cannot judge whether you're doing a good job with your uh, business or whatever. He has not, not a clue about it. But uh, so that's an interesting thing. He said, but if true impersonality is cultivated, if the power to stand steady is developed, if every situation is handled in a spirit of love, and if there is a refusal to take hasty action and to permit separation to creep in, then there will be growth, the growth of a group of true servers and the gathering out of those who can materialize the plan and bring to birth the new age and its attendant workers. So what you might consider is how many of these type of people are on the earth now that have really uh, worked through the problems of personal power, of of glamours, of selfishness, of working to see their own desires materialize rather than higher will. How many have transcended these so that they can work as a group to bring in the higher energies and really bring in the new age the way it's supposed to be? Uh, I think in some ways we're kind of behind. When I read uh, some of the wishes of DK where he was uh, hoping that certain things would happen by this time, because a lot of the stuff he wrote was in the 30s, 40s, uh, some in the 50s, um, that he was, uh, he seemed to be expecting us to be more... uh, into the new age than we are right now. So I think there's, my guess is there's been several setbacks. Uh, It's quite possible we've had some benefits that weren't foreseen. Uh, Nobody really predicted the internet that I think um, a couple of science fiction writers might have, but uh, uh, nobody in the spiritual movement predicted the internet and it's quite possible the internet is a tool that uh, can overcome some of the setbacks that we've had as society in our spiritual evolution. But on the other hand, there's problems with the internet too. People spend a lot of time just with frivolous stuff on uh, uh, there that, uh, uh, and people are, going more into sound bites like I notice on this is one of the reasons I've gone to emphasizing uh, uh, quotations on Facebook is because uh, they're short and people uh, glom on to sound bites on like Facebook but if you post something with a lot of with a full article or something and not very many people read it. Uh, 
people are just there's so much available on the internet that people uh, flip from one thing to another and they don't really glom on to something of substance. Whereas in the old days, you go to a bookstore, you buy a book and you read the book from one end to the other and you absorb a lot of uh, impactful material that a lot of people today are glossing over. Now, some people still read books, but I, I think a lot of people uh, are not reading things with a lot of substance, but are flitting from one thing to another. But the disciples must uh, absorb principles in as much detail and uh, substance as possible so that they can, they can be uh, useful. Any comments on that before we move on here? Yeah, I do. Uh, uh, speaking of uh, years of experience and disciples working uh, and, and your teachings, is exactly the question I was uh, uh, thinking of asking about today was uh, <clears throat> in your imagination, in your visioning or whatever, uh, looking forward into a uh, desired future, what we can become. Uh, We've been connected together doing this work for, for over 20 years. And I'm curious, what do you think we will uh, group wise uh, evolve into in the next 20 years? In other words, when we are out of the wilderness. <laughs> well, you never know because it's quite possible something significant would happen that could really uh, put some of our ideas before the, the general public in a way that's never happened before. Now that could be a game changer for us. Uh, if we just proceed as we have in the past and we'll just make uh, baby steps and keep it going. But uh, it's, uh, I, I've always thought there's going to be some, some things happen that will uh, cause uh, the teachings to, uh, something in the teachings to uh, capture the imagination of the public. But uh, uh, JJ, isn't there something coming in the 2025 uh, concave? Uh the DK talks about uh, the new understanding of be around by then. Yeah, DK. Uh, every every uh, century in the around the twenty fifth year, the masters meet in conclave and decide how they're going to uh, uh, handle the next hundred years, and they change usually make some changes to the approach and how they're going to do things. And uh, DK hinted at the fact that uh, new teachings will be given out sometime after the year 2025. And he said, uh, if I recall, he indicated it wouldn't be through Alice A. Bailey reincarnated, but he didn't say how the teachings will be presented. It's possible he's incarnated and plans on giving them in person. Who knows? <laughs> that would I think, be I think we, we have to appropriate the media. We have to, to encourage and, and fund those people who can spread this kind of truth. You know, when I was a teenager and when I was a child, there were a lot of things on the radio that were very inspiring. A lot of speakers, a lot of very enlightened information was given out. But the radio nowadays and the television is just mind-rotting mind crap. Yeah. Matter of fact, that's one of the things DK said. He said after 1975, he anticipated the esoteric teachings would be given out through the radio and the media uh, quite uh, strongly, but that never happened. You know, they, uh, uh, we've never had anybody in the media really promote esoteric teachings and so this we this was a setback for the hierarchy and this is still something that needs to be done and uh, fortunately we're able to do it a little bit on the internet there's a lot of internet groups that are promoting different new age ideas so it is happening on the internet somewhat but uh, there's nobody like uh, um, 
that's really taken the ball and presented it so millions of people hear it, like on talk talk radio, uh, for instance, uh, millions of people hear these guys. Uh, we don't hear anybody, or we don't even hear anybody like a, a comparable to the TV preachers that's teaching, that it's out there teaching uh, the higher truths. Don't have one person anywhere. Uh, the Luce, Luce's Trust has made a couple of videos and put them on some radio stations, but their, uh, their reach has been very, very small. Uh, they just have an I think if you listen to Sab Guru, uh, he's bringing uh, a, a whole, whole enlightenment of what's uh, this new uh, paradigm. Him and uh, Swami Sabi Parayana. Sab Guru and Swami Sabi Parayana are two good, uh, two good ones to listen to to see understand uh, what's going on with, with uh, how to think, how to process your thoughts. Uh, they're pretty good people to listen to. Are they what on YouTube or something? Yeah, we do have a lot of people yeah, uh, showing up on YouTube. YouTube is kind of helping to fulfill the uh, prediction of uh, DK and the fact that, matter of fact, we're putting these lessons on YouTube. So uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting things on YouTube. A person has to be real yeah, careful yeah, about. Uh, what he picks because there's a lot of misinformation out there too. In regards to what you're saying about short things that people can share, I suggest uh, maybe doing some short videos and uploading them on your channel. Yeah, I've been thinking of uh, doing some uh, videos more of uh, uh, general interest. Is that what you're kind of thinking of, Joshua? Me yeah, you could do like a three minute video, a five minute video or something, or maybe 10 minutes on some topic or something. Yeah, I noticed uh, I did one on the molecular relationship uh, years ago. Uh, uh, my son, I, I just got a new camera and my son grabbed it and he says, uh, here, say something. And I'll put it on uh, YouTube. So. <laughs> I talked about the molecular relationship just off the cuff, and he, he put it on. Uh, somebody needs to mute uh, themselves there. Um, Come up with no, a new form of. Uh, we need and, a new form of. And I, anyway, we I I just spoke off the cuff, and we put it on, uh, and it, it's got more hits than anything I've ever done. So that's kind of funny. Yeah, we need new age comedy. Comedy goes over well, you know, and it gets a message across. Yeah, matter of fact, I was going to post something my wife found, uh, somebody making fun of the virus and instructions on it, how uh, they were uh, contradictory. And it was it's pretty funny. I'll have to post that. But, uh, yeah, humor stuff really does get a lot of attention. You might be on to something, Rick. Uh, okay. Any other comments before we move on? Well, you just have to reach people where they're receptive. They're receptive to comedy. People like a good laugh. They're receptive to, uh, uh, I think, an upward trend in social interaction because of this virus where people are much more appreciative of uh, what they can't have. and the social interaction is something that they're being denied. And so I think that might be opening a channel of opportunity uh, all by itself. You know, I have to think of doing something on the humorous side. <laughs> that would be interesting. Okay. I, I know a lady in Los Angeles who works with TV producers to introduce content that is progressive. Oh, yeah? There is a movement there in Los Angeles. It is not very widespread, but there's an effort to work with the writers of content and some of these sitcoms to produce some forward-thinking, motivating ideas. Yeah. And, you know, um, YouTube uh, provides uh, 
see uh, spiritual people with an opportunity to, to maybe catch up some of the ground that we didn't uh, capture by uh, being in the media from 1976 on, as the Tibetan talked about. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe we have an opportunity to do some catch-up work and promote the work. So uh, uh, that's something to think about. And there's, there's a number of uh, pretty, pretty intelligent people presenting uh, good material on YouTube. You kind of have to, it's kind of hard to find though. You, you, I find you have to go through four or five uh, videos on YouTube to, then to find one that uh, has something really interesting in it. But uh, it's, people it's make at least it, out there. People make it a point to remember the the jokes they hear so that they can share them with their friends when they meet up. You know, did you hear the latest joke? And it's like, so if you can put principles out there using jokes, I think uh, Carlin tried to do that a lot and uh, was was very good at it. Yeah, you know, humor the humor is very powerful. I'll have yeah, to, people uh, want they want to remember good jokes. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And good jokes are very, it takes a lot of creativity to come up with them. Yeah. So in speaking of the uh, type of disciple that the uh, masters can really work with, he says to become such a person, he says there must be courage of the rarest kind. Fear holds the world in thrall and no one is exempt from its influence. I find a lot of people that think they're enlightened, think they're completely exempt from fear, but DK says no one is completely exempt from its influence. And there's a lot of people in denial about uh, their, their fears. And, uh, but uh, uh, fear, fear, he said, he made the interesting statement that fear is ingrained in the warp and the woof of the fabric of the universe itself, which, was interesting so it's it's that's why it's so hard to escape fear to escape fear a person needs to uh, be very strongly connected to the source that created the universe to begin with he says there are fears generated by the mind and instinctual fears such as the fear of survival or the fear of death uh, fears are overcome by the life of the soul as it permeates and transforms the daily life and by the refusal of the aspirant to accord them any recognition. Okay. So if you focus on a source of fear, then the fear increases. So the, one of the ways to overcome fear is just to not pay a lot of attention to it. Now, in times of physical, uh, where physical courage is called for, the people that are, do the most courageous thing, like say the fireman, he has to go in a burning building. If he thinks about it, he probably won't go in. <laughs> but the ones that are most courageous is the ones that don't even think about the danger. They just think this person needs saved and they go. Okay. So this, uh, this is uh the way that people overcome their fears is they just put the uh, the negativity out of their mind, and this is very hard for a mental person to do. As a person progresses, he becomes more mental, and so he looks at the situation more thoroughly and thinks, "If I do this, this will happen." Whereas the person who's a little bit lesser evolved doesn't look at it so mentally and he, he can actually be more uh, more fearless <laughs> in many cases on the physical level because he doesn't analyze every every possibility whereas as the person progresses he begins to analyze more and it, we tend to start analyzing too much so much that uh, uh, we generate too many fears and and as he says, some some disciples go through a period where they become neurotic because they uh, 
they let this type of thing get the best of them. And so the once the person be, develops his mind, then he has to make that connection with the soul. And the soul helps him to alleviate his fears. And so fear is always something to deal with. You overcome one fear, and then you've got fear on another level. And then you overcome that, and then you got things on another level to overcome. So there's always something to work on. Well, John Wayne uh, said it best. He said, real courage is feeling the fear and mounting up anyway. That's exactly right. And uh, that's when you know somebody has courage is when they're facing a dangerous situation and they plunge ahead anyway. And it takes a lot of guts to go into a dangerous situation knowing it's dangerous. Okay. Now, the person that goes into a dangerous situation not knowing it's dangerous, that doesn't take nearly as much courage. But uh, the Fools rush in where angels fear to go, they say. But, you know, the, the solution to fear, fear of the unknown is knowledge, the knowledge and faith. When you know that you're supported by all of life, you can eliminate fear. Yeah, yeah. Well, once you've done karaoke five or six times, you're, you know, you're <laughs> afraid to go up and grab the microphone. But yeah. Sometimes it's the first time, oh, there's that microphone. Ah! <laughs> yeah, and if you're wearing the state-of-the-art fireproof suit, I trust me, you can't wait to jump into that fire and show off on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then he says, as a disciple develops mind, he calculates his odds, and this may generate great fear. The person who does not do much thinking sometimes has an easier time being the hero. On the other hand, the advanced person negates some illogical fears, such as, for instance, can you think of some illogical fears like the fear of flying or maybe much greater fear of the virus than than anything warrants, especially if you're young and healthy. Uh, even if you get it, it won't be, it's probably not a death sentence. But if you're uh, got high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, uh, heart problems, uh, lung problems, then, then you have a legitimate fear of the virus at that point. Yeah, but uh, fear of flying is a good one because they say um, it's a it's a lot safer to fly than to just drive your car to the grocery store. So um, um, a lot more people die through uh, automobile accidents and flying, but people are much more nervous about flying, and that's because. This is an example of one fear that people have. If they think about it, then they will fear less because they can look at the statistics in their mind. And, uh, but on the other hand, where the mind increases a fear is when you look at the statistics and you find the statistics are not in your favor, then the fear becomes legitimate. He says a mental types must negate fear thought forms and let them die through lack of nourishment. Our instinctual fears are neutralized through soul contact. The fears which are linked to the planetary life, uh, there's a number of them linked to the planetary life and there are five in number. Let's see if we got time here. We're nearly out of time, so we'll uh, start covering these five next week. But let's go over this last sentence here. The, uh, uh, we need to let our fears, the mental types, he says. In other words, the mental types, the problem they have with fears is that they think, uh, they start thinking, well, the disciple may think, I, I'm not good enough to do this work. I'm just going to let other people handle everything because they maybe have a fear of failure. Uh, but whatever it is, once the fears are amplified by the mind and they start to control the person, 
the person has to let it die through lack of nourishment. Just, just don't think about the thing that causes you fear. Just act as if that thing does not exist and move ahead as if there is uh, the causes of the fear do not even have an existence. And uh, so that's uh, here's the thing on the, on the plane of the soul, uh, the things that cause us to be fearful on the plane of the soul, it doesn't experience fear, doesn't register fear. That's personality based. So you have to ask yourself if I'm afraid, uh, what part of my personality is, is uh, am I going to lose or is going to be hurt or damaged? But on the plane of the soul, uh, which is immortal, it doesn't feel any fear. So that's an interesting point, Curtis. Is uh, the soul doesn't feel any pain and doesn't feel any fear. Or worry. Now, a lot of our uh, uh, fears are around pain, and because the soul doesn't feel pain, it has nothing to fear. And so uh, uh, down here, we have plenty of pain and lots of stuff that we uh, tempt us to fear. And so this is kind of funny uh, relationship we have with our soul, which is really the higher part of our own selves. So this higher part of ourselves is looking down and it's planning things for us. And some of those plans may be involved going through some painful, stressful, fearful situations. And for the soul, it's no big deal. But for us down here, the doing the grunt work, <laughs> it's, it's a big deal for us sometimes. <laughs> right. And so what's really a big deal for us is no big deal for our higher self. And so uh, uh, some people might think, well, my higher self just doesn't seem to understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, the more self-connected you become, the less you fear. Right. So if we connect to the higher self and identify it with, it, with it, then we there's a sense of peace. Uh -huh. that uh, negates a lot of the potential fears that are out there. And so the, this uh, soul contact that uh, we've stressed so much just can't be stressed enough because it solves so many problems that we have as individuals. Okay, any other comments or questions? Yeah. Well, Rachel's having her operation on a Tuesday morning, so everybody be sending her thoughts and prayers and hope everything works out for her. And Maria needs lots of energy sent to her. She's just uh, working really hard, you can tell. And, I look uh, like that. <laughs> <laughs> You look like you could use a little uplift. Thank yeah, you. so we're on your side. Remember that. Thank you. How's your brother doing? That's what I was going to say. That um, I'm. I'm so grateful for um, the healing and the prayers. And uh, my brother is uh, is. He's still he's doing sibling. okay. Good, good, yes. Good, good. Yeah, they oh, say, uh, well, that's one question they have about the virus. Uh, they don't know if you can get it again. So let's hope uh, let's hope people are immune once they've had it. They're still mm -hmm. doing research on that. Yeah, the doctors didn't think he was going to make it. So um, they are very, uh, they told him, you are a very fortunate, one of the few fortunate ones. Oh, good. Uh, he had to take uh, medi uh, heave medicines. Was he medicine. on a ventil Was he on a ventilator? Yeah. Was he? Oh, he, so yeah. Once you get on one of those ventilators, you don't. Your chances will go way down. Yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah. Well, you. Everybody. You're certainly welcome, and we're you. We're certainly deserved to have your brother with you. A longer period of time. Okay, uh, any other comments or questions before we sign off? 
have faith. Just have faith and know that you are connected. Well, to sum up, sum up this lesson, as disciples, everybody here is, uh, has a sense of responsibility about uh, serving humanity. And so don't, give, don't, don't lose faith and don't let the fears get the best of you and proceed as if there is nothing to fear. And you will receive your reward one way or another. Often the reward that you get for service is something you didn't expect, but better than you expected. Saying that, we will see you guys next week, next Sunday at uh, 10 o'clock, I'll be in law. Or Tuesday, come on to the 11th labor. Finally, I think we're going to get through it. <laughs> okay, so you're having your class on Tuesday as scheduled then, Curtis? Tuesday at 7. Okay. Yeah. The Aquarian labor where you become a real servant. Okay. Uh, JJ, I think Mosiah.